When working with data, we often want to create a single figure with multiple plots on it. And one way that we could achieve this is to use matplotlib and use functions such as subplot to grid and plt.subplots to build up our subplots and our figure. However, this can result in a large amount of lines of code as well as getting very confusing when you're starting to look at it. And this is where the Seaborn Library's Facet Grid comes in. Hey friends, I'm Andy, and if you already knew that, then welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to see how we can use the Facet Grid from Seaborn to build up a figure with multiple subplots using a few key arguments. We will see how we can apply scatter plots, histograms, and box plots to the facet grid. And this allows us to split our data up by different classes. And we can start to see more interesting patterns emerge per different class, all within the same figure. Let's hop over to our Jupyter Notebook and see how we can get started using the facet grid. So for this tutorial, we're going to be working with two libraries. Seaborn, which is imported as SNS, and Pandas, which is imported as PD. So Pandas is going to be used to load our data in, which comes from a Kaggle dataset focusing on significant earthquakes from 1965 up to 2015. And we can import that using pd.read underscore csv. So if you want access to this data, you can go to the, the website here. It is public domain data, or you can download it from the GitHub repository that I've linked down in the description below, which takes you to the Seaborn examples that I've been covering in the last few videos. So we will begin importing the libraries and the data, and then we can have a quick look at what we have within that data. We can see that we've got a multitude of columns with different dates, times, latitude, longitudes, magnitudes, so now that that data is in, we just need to prepare the data a little bit for the purpose of this exercise. So what I'm going to do is create a new column in the data frame which classifies the earthquake based on the magnitude. So when we have a magnitude between 5.0 and 5.9, then it will be classified as moderate. And then if we've got more than that, so if we've got six, between 6 and 6.9, it will be classified as strong, major and great and so on. So this little function will be used to create a new column within our data frame and we can apply that to our data frame and create a new column called class. So what I'm doing here is taking the earthquakes data frame and then applying our function which is magnitude classification and we're applying that to the columns which is represented by axis is equal to 1. So when we view the data and call upon the data frame we can now see that we've got an extra column on our data frame at the end, and this is our class. So we can see that we've, it's been classified correctly. We've got strong for a magnitude of 6.0, moderate for a 5.8, and so on all the way down. So we're now going to move on to creating our first plot. And the way that we do it with facet grid is that we create the grid and then we map data to it. So we can call upon sns.facetgrid and pass in earthquakes and what we get back is a simple axis or a simple grid. However, we've not got any data to it but this just forms the backbone of what we're about to do. And what we generally do is we assign this to the variable say G or P or depending on how you want to call it but most commonly it's assigned to the letter G for graph. So when we run that and we don't have the extra information that's often printed when you call upon a, a plot within Seaborn or matplotlib. So let's start applying data to our facet grid. And the first one that we're going to do is apply a scatter plot. So if I take what I have here, paste that in there, and then we call upon g.map, which means that we're going to map something to this facet grid. So then we assign the type of plot that we want to apply to our facet grid. In this case, I'm going to apply a scatter plot, which is called upon by sns.scatterplot. And then we're going to specify the x, which is going to be year. And then the y axis is going to be magnitude. And I will also set the alpha to 0 0.5. So what we get back is a very simple scatter plot with the year on the x-axis and the magnitude on the y-axis. And we can see that we've got quite a large amount of data here. So to analyze this data a little bit better, we're going to start splitting it up into individual columns. If I take the same code that we had above, and within the facet grid call, what I'm going to add is an argument for call, which is abbreviation for column. And I'm going to set that to type. And I will add a semicolon at the end to suppress this message here. Based on the type, what we've done is we've split that data out into individual columns. So we've got our earthquake data, 
We've also got nuclear explosions, general explosions and a rock burst, a single point in 2010. So from this we can now see or start to see that the earthquakes have quite a wide range of magnitudes all across all of the years. The nuclear explosions sort of range from around about the 1960s to the mid 1990s. However, the magnitudes go up to about 7 at the very most. And then we've got random explosions and rock bursts. So we don't know what the we don't know what the cause of these are within the data set. However, we can just visualize them here just for for this exercise. I'm going to change this up a little bit and change the variable that we're going to plot. So instead of magnitude, we're going to start looking at depth. And when we run that, we get back very similar scatter plots. However, we now see that we've got depth on the y axis. When looking at depth, we're talking about depth below the surface. So, and generally we want to view this going from a shallow depth up here down to a deeper depth down here. And we can do that by calling upon g.set and within the brackets we're going to pass in y lim and we'll set this equal to 750 to minus 10. You'll notice that the numbers are inverted, so we're going with the deepest number first, and that is how we can simply invert the y-axis. We've also added 10 meters onto the top of this to allow us to see the data at the top. So I forgot to put in the equal sign, and we can rerun that, and now we get back the plots, and we can see that the earthquakes are again ranging in depths from 0 to 700, but all the nuclear explosions, explosions and rock bursts, are relatively shallow within the, the Earth's surface. So we're already getting some insight into this data. And we can start expanding this a little bit. At the start, we created a new column called class, and that split our earthquakes into different groups of magnitude. And we can display that data along with the columns by adding a new argument called row is equal to class. So when we run this, we get back a multifaceted plot where we've got our classes in the rows, and you can see that here we've got the strong, type of earthquakes, moderate earthquakes, great earthquakes that are greater than 8.0 on the Richter scale, and then we've got our major earthquakes. So we can see already that we're starting to split the data out into something that's a bit more meaningful, and we can see that the most of the large earthquakes that are over 8.0 on the Richter scale are relatively shallow events with a few very deep events. However, you can see that this is a bit messy. We can see that we've got overlapping text here, and we're also out of order on the classes. So to clean up the titles, what we can do is add in a new row here and we call upon g.set underscore titles and then open brackets and then we're going to pass in call template and this is our column template or text template and we'll simplify that down to the column name. So instead of having class and type here we're just going to have the text after the equal sign. And we can do the same for the rows by calling upon row template is equal to and then we pass in row name. So when we run this, what we get back is the same grid as above, but you can see that the text is much clearer and there's no overlapping between the, the titles. And this just makes it much easier to read what each of these subplots actually are. So the final thing that we're going to do to these scatter plots is to order them. So at the moment we're going from strong 6.0 to 6.9, and then down to moderate, and then all the way up to great and then back down to major. So there's no order to these rows. So what we can do is we can specify a row order. So if I copy and paste the code from above, we can add a new argument within the facet grid called row order. So row underscore order. What we need to pass to it is a list. So I will just copy and paste in what I've got from earlier. So here I've got a list where I've got the moderate earthquakes first, then the strong ones, then the major ones, and then the great ones. And when we run that, we get back the same grid, but now they're in the right order. So we've got our moderate earthquakes, strong, major, and then great earthquakes. And now we can start analyzing the data. We can see that the most nuclear explosions are moderate to strong with nothing greater than a magnitude of seven. And we can see that most earthquakes are moderate to strong, with some major earthquakes and very few great earthquakes. And we can see that we've got explosions, which are very few, so I think we've got about four points here. And we can see that we have moderate to strong explosions here, and then a rock burst within this particular row here. Facet grid is not only limited to using scatter plots, we can also apply histograms to the facet grid. 
And we can do the same thing that we did above. We create a variable called G and then call upon SNS.facetGrid and we pass it in the data frame that we're going to use, which is earthquakes. And then we will split the columns by type. And then we can map on our histogram by calling upon g.map and then sns.histplot and then we set what variable we want to create our histogram of and we will set that to year. And then add the semicolon at the end to suppress the messages that we sometimes see. So we get back our histograms of the earthquakes, uh, the nuclear explosions, and we can't see the explosion in rock burst types as the, the counts of these are very small. So if we wanted to, we could call upon g.set and then ylim is equal to 0 to 100. And we can now start to see the explosions as well as a very small rock burst around about 2009-2010. However, when we look at the uh, earthquakes, we can see that we're maxed out on the on the y-axis. So it's not a great scale for look, viewing the data in that sense. So we can take that back off and then just run it again and we get back our histogram. We can also change the bins and that is done as normal with our histogram arguments by passing in bins is equal to say five. And what we get back is five bins within each data set if, if we have enough data. So here we can see the data is now split into five bins and we can see that we've got a general increase in earthquakes uh, over the years. And that is not necessarily down to increasing numbers of earthquakes, it's probably down to how we monitor the earthquakes and the better technology that we have to be able to identify them and understand them. So another plot type that we can display on these facet grids are box plots. And we can do the same as what we've got above the exact same code and what we pass in instead of hist plot is box plot and we take off the bins argument at the end and we get back the box plots for each of the different types and we can see that we've got a wide range of earthquakes and we can see that nuclear explosions and so they started around the 1960s and earlier uh, but this data set is limited to 1965 and then the last tests are, are around the late 90s and we can see that explosions are being monitored here from around about the 1970s up to about the mid-1980s. And then we've got a single rock burst. So from this, we can understand where we've got the greatest density of earthquakes here. And the same with the nuclear explosions, which were quite prolific according to this data from around about 1977 up to about 1986. So that just shows that you can use histograms, scatter plots, and box plots within Facet Grid, and you can also use many of the other types of plots that are available within Seaborn, including the kernel density estimation plots and bar charts. And there we have it, we've seen how to create small multiple plots or subplots with a few key commands within the function. And that saves us significant time compared to using matplotlib to build up individual subplots. If you've enjoyed today's video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more content from this channel, click on that subscribe button and ding that notification bell. So thanks for watching, and until next time, bye for now.